you have entered the jungle, home of Jaguar Soccer. Our visitors for tonight's matchup are the Mason City Riverhawks and your Centennial Jaguars. It's time to meet the starting lineups. First, for the visiting Riverhawks. Forward for the River Hawks, a senior, number three, J.P. Miles. At midfield, a junior, number five, Noah Ruiz. At midfield, a senior, number six, Austin Masawi. On the fence, a senior, number nine, Brody Lee. At midfield, a senior, number 10, Drew DeGabriel. On defense, a junior, number 11, Jack Donald. On defense, a sophomore, number 23, Will Sizzle. At midfield, a sophomore, number 24, Jackson Millett. On defense, a sophomore, number 26, William Simpson. At midfield, a junior, number 29, Jose Abregon Jr. In goal for the Riverhawks, a senior, number zero, Eric Farland. Now it's time to meet the starting lap for your Centennial Jaguars. Midfield for the Jaguars, a sophomore, number two, Brock Rizzo. At midfield, a senior, number three, Isaac Kittinger. On defense, a sophomore, number five, Andrew Kruger. At midfield, a sophomore, number six, Ben Rizlin. At midfield, a sophomore, number seven, Lucas De La Cuba. On the fence, a junior, number nine, Tyson Waterhawk. At midfield, a senior, number ten, Ty Duet. At midfield, a junior, number seventeen, Caleb Murray. At forward. A senior, number 19, Logan Hayes. And on the fence, a senior, number 22, Brock Bo Brazo. In goal for the Jaguars, a senior, the double zero, Andrew Nelson. Freedom Tire is proud to be the title sponsor of supporting Jaguar student-athletes through Centennial Digital. With six locations around the metro, you're never far from getting you back or keeping your family safely on the road. Our certified staff and state-of-the-art technology means you can take comfort knowing you've got the best work at the best prices. Come see us at Freedom Tire, a proud supporter of Centennial Digital. I've been with U.S. Cellular for years now. They asked me to tell you about their special customer event, Us Days. Exclusive deals, like up to $1,200 for any new phone. So I said, if I'm going to be on TV, think I can get hair and makeup? And I even got a manicure, too. Us Days at U.S. Cellular. Get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. <laughs> So when an athlete walks into Nick Garage Fitness, the one thing we want them to know is that this is a phenomenal community. We have the best coaching, we have the best technology, we have the, the 
programming that can help them succeed. So whether it's trying to get on JV for the first time, going to that next level on varsity, going from a, a second string to you know an all-state player, we have the tools, we have the, the programming and the coaching in order to take each individual to their next level. matchup between the Ankeny Centennial Jaguars and the Mason City River Hawks coming to you on a kind of a, like a pretty nice night for early season soccer. I'm here with uh, Ken, Kenzie Langstrat, uh, a uh, 2019 Jaguar, Centennial Jaguar graduate. She was part of the state championship team a couple years ago, uh, as well as a uh, college soccer player, played some midfield and some uh, defense. Uh, welcome, Kenzie. Nice to have you on the broadcast. Thank you. Um, now, Kinsey, like as a player um, with a lot of experience here, we got these early season games. I've been, to, you know, I've called the game already. You've called the game already. I think, uh, uh, what kind of things are you looking for to get accomplished? Uh, you know, to kind of get checked, like a box checked off in these early season games. I definitely think in these early season games, you're looking for who can possess the ball better, who can move the ball up and down the field with control and cohesive as a unit. Um, I think it's super important to take note of the mistakes that will happen and just go back and analyze those in the film room in those early season games. Um, just preparing for all the competition that you're going to face throughout the season and making sure that you're ready for everything that other teams are going to throw at you. Absolutely. So we've got the uh, Centennial Jags uh, are going to be in the all black and they're going to be on the right. They're going to be moving to your left and the uh, River Hawks, which is a new mascot for Mason City, uh, is going to be moving from left to right in the all white uniforms. So it looks like uh, Centennial Jags are going to start off with possession. I think Ty Duex, uh, one of the uh, main scorers for the Centennial Jaguars, a senior midfielder forward, is going to be the first one to touch the ball and put it into the play. Got 40 minutes on the clock for this first half, and we're ready for some soccer tonight here on the north side of Ankeny. Here we go. And Duex puts it into play. Long ball played. It's going to be number 19, Logan Page is trying to chase that ball down. He does get some possession here as he moves it into the middle. He's going to look for a cross, but actually he looks to take his own shot. I think it might have been a deflection. We might have our first corner of the game. Nope, they're going to call a goal kick. I thought it was pretty close to being touched by somebody there as he took that shot. Yeah, the defender about got it with his foot, it looked like. That would have been a pretty early corner for uh, for a competition like this, uh, getting an early uh, set piece. But uh Alas, it's just a goal kick for the uh, River Hawks as they put the ball out there and uh, Centennial gets a possession and uh, very deep here in the offensive zone for them. That's a nice little ball in. Nice cross in there. That's a little bit dangerous as the goalie doesn't really know where to go and a strike already early. And that is number nine. That is Tyson Wodehoff Wodehoff for the first goal for the Jags tonight. I think that was number nine. Was it number three? It might have been three. Might have been I number think it three, was three there. Isaac Ken Kenninger uh, with the goal. It was number three. Saw the little curl in the top. I thought it was number nine. That's uh, Isaac Kenninger, a uh, uh, senior uh, defender that was in there on that attack for the first score of the game. It's a 1-0 lead early in the game for the Jags. That ball comes in. Or that goal comes in one minute into the game. Great start for the Jags. Kind of almost two shots, one of them scored, but almost two shots on goal here right in the first minute of the game. Yeah, that's definitely a good start for Centennial. You can definitely see that they're now putting that high pressure on, trying to build up out of the back. I think the thing I noticed about the game I called last week was the, you know, just the shape of both teams is very tight. And I can see it kind of already starting a little bit here. We got pretty much everybody in between the 30 and the 30 right now. Everybody's uh, pretty pretty uh, compact and usually as that season gets uh, gets on a little bit that shape tends to stretch out a little bit you start to see some room but um, I think that's one of the early th things that uh, early season things that kind of happens with uh, most teams as they get ready to go into their conference schedules yeah you definitely can always hear coaches yelling at the beginning of the season to spread out or make space because I do feel like it definitely starts more compacted. Yeah, like right now, we're like 40 to uh -huh. 40 here. We've got about, we got about 20 yards here, and every player in the, uh, the whole field is in that uh, little set there. Nice pass to the outside, but it looks like the goalkeeper's going to get there. It was a touch there, but the goalkeeper takes him out. No call. He was in that possession. That was a clean, of, yeah. Well, yeah, it was, was kind of in possession of the ball as he took that player out. 
Logan Page gets launched up into the air over the top of the goalie. The goal scorer, Kenninger, puts the ball into play. I like those tight little passes that Centennial's looking to make around the 18. Those can be tough, especially on a probably slightly wet turf still from the rain we got earlier. Yeah, just kind of a factor, I'm sure. That ball's definitely wet as uh, we send a ball in there. But uh, the, the uh, goalie, Eric Farland, senior goalkeeper for the Riverhawks, has no trouble with that one. He's going to send that ball into play. So it does look like there's like a glint on the ball for sure. I'm guessing that you are probably accurate, Kenzie. It's pretty, it is a little bit wet down there. Yeah, you can definitely tell by the way it skips when it hits the air just a little bit. Yeah, Jags definitely spreading it around here as they cycle it across the back line for the defense. Page sends it up. Going to get a touch here from Lucas De La Cuba. He tries to go one-on-one -on -one with his defender, gets past it. Second defender's in his way. Nice little move. It's going to be a center pass up to Duax. Duax going to step up and take the shot. It's going to be a little bit to the right. But a nice little uh, connection there between De La Cuba and Duax to uh, get a shot on goal. Is it starting to rain? It's, it is starting to rain. The rain just started out of kind of out of nowhere. I was just going to say that it's it's actually turned out to be a pretty pleasant evening here. With the, <laughs> it seemed like the wind was going down, but all of a sudden uh, the clouds are opening up here, and it's just a little bit of a drizzle here. Yeah, I, I had heard that on the news this tonight that we could get some uh, some frozen mixes here tonight, but uh, it looked like everything was further to the west of us. Surprise, surprise. Spring soccer for for everybody, right? That's uh, you never know what you're going to get for spring soccer. Riverhawks have done a nice job of getting uh, some possession into their offensive zone, but uh, they send the ball out of bounds. It'll be a throw in for the Jaguars. So, kids, what kind of things do change when when it does start raining like this? Do you know, as a as an athlete, you know, what do you look at? Uh, having an impact on uh, on the game here now that everything's starting to get wet especially when you're playing on turf that ball is going to skip so a lot of players especially when it's dry you know you get a foot out and you can usually get a touch on it but if you just have your foot out you don't have your whole body behind that ball it's going to go right past you so just being mindful of where you're at your positioning um also being mindful of the passes that you play are going to skip especially if they hit the air so keeping those passes on the ground is super important to maintain possession as well. And be willing to pounce on other mistakes like yeah. what just happened because yeah. those are going to happen when it gets wet. Nice little exchange here. Uh, Centennial with some uh, nice little passes back and forth trying to get a shot on goal, but they uh, ricochet one off one of the Mason City defenders and it goes out of bounds. It'll be a throw-in for the Jags. It'll be Brock Brizzo in for the throw-in. Definitely going to be a frozen mix coming down now. You can hear it now that there's uh, definitely some some solid aspects to this rain that's coming down. So, so do you like playing in in the like conditions like this, or would you prefer a perfect situation? Mm, I like playing in the rain, but not cold rain. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I can definitely understand that. I think one of the most miserable sporting events I've ever been at was about 36 degrees and raining and it was completely miserable especially for fans but I remember youth soccer uh, my daughter's team one of the girls just quit at halftime she's like I'm done just uh she's like called her mom and she's like we're going home <laughs> <laughs> yeah my freshman year I was an itty bitty little freshman on a team that had some powerhouse girls that went on to play and we were at the Burlington Tournament of Champions that the girls' soccer team goes to every year. And yep. it was pouring rain. And the championship game, we were winning. And Coach Allen, the girls' soccer coach, looks at me in the last, like, 10 minutes. There's already puddles in my shoes. He's like, okay, warm up. You're going in. And I just wanted to cry, I remember. Yeah. It was so awful. It was sideways rain. It was so cold. That's always a huge tournament, too, isn't it? That the one they bring some schools in from in, in Illinois as yep, well? Yep, Illinois, like the Wisconsin. I think maybe, maybe Missouri. Maybe Missouri. Yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. So I know there's always some early, some big, uh, you know, early season matchups in that. Yes. But it's always a good one to kind of test yourself and show you where you're at. For sure. 
Yeah, it was also fun nice to Nice little explain. pass to Duax. I don't know if he was offsides. That was pretty well played there by Duax, but gets called for offsides. Uh, just about a third of the way into the offensive zone. It'll bring it back out. It'll be a free kick for the Riverhawks. I thought that was pretty close. That I, was close. I, I thought he was on. He made a nice little uh, delayed little run there. I think he thinks the same thing as he's trudging back <laughs> up the field. Looks like he's uh, a little bit angry. It would have been a one-on-one -on -one with the goalie, too, so it would have been a big play. Yeah, he wanted that for sure. Here in the start of the game. Well, kind of contrary to the beginning of the game, the Riverhawks have gotten a little bit of possession here as uh, we've gotten into the first uh, 10 minutes of the match here. Uh, Centennial sends it out of bounds. It'll be a throw in for the Riverhawks. Duax lets that one run by. He's going to send it to the outside to Logan Page. Logan Page has a cross. Nicely settled to back to Duax. He takes a shot, and it ricochets off of one of the defenders and then out of bounds. It'll be a throw in for the Jaguars. Riverhawks are definitely keeping numbers behind the ball. They're not sending a lot of numbers forward. No, I can see seven right there within about 10 yards of each other right at the back line. So it's not something you see very often unless teams are kind of parking the bus there trying to make sure no other uh, shots on goal are happening. But I think I think the Jags are going to do all right because they've, they've shown some propensity to kind of be able to make some of those short passes like you were talking about earlier inside that box and trying to make those connections. Yeah, for sure. Those will be super important. Just that play around the box, getting to goal, waiting for the right opportunity and being patient is super important. Yeah, that patience at the high school level sometimes is hard to, hard to contain as Duex takes a shot uh, from about 20 yards out and it goes to the left. It'll be a free kick or a uh, goal kick for the Riverhawks. Like I was saying, that patience is for a high school team is sometimes, especially early season, when you all you want to do is get that ball into the back of the net. It's hard to uh, – it's very easy to get frustrated with when those passes aren't going your way or aren't getting to the back of the net. But, uh, you know, those good teams, so probably some of which you've been on, you know, has that, has that patience to just keep doing those fundamentals and, and focusing on those passes in order to get those shots that you want. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, offensively, this is a pretty veteran team. Duax has been playing forward for the for the Jags pretty much his whole career, so he's going to understand the to have that patience up at the front to be able to uh, use that to his advantage and just keep that pressure on the River Hawks as they uh, have a nice little piece of possession here. They center the ball in. Jaguar defenders there to thwart that uh, push forward. Jags lose uh, control here, but we get our first touch of the game for Andrew Nelson as he uh, snatches that ball up and uh, rolls it back into play. They play it back to Nelson. He sends it to the near side. Yeah, it doesn't feel like there's very many defenders. The, these forwards for the Riverhawks are definitely not very far forward. There, Duox That's going to be off. going to be way offsides on that one. First one was well-timed. This one was not <laughs> so well-timed, but. That's a tough for a forward to be making that attack to the near side and have all those defenders on your backside. You're not able to, you know, you're looking at that ball, trying to make a play on it, but you're not able to turn around and look and see where the rest of those defenders are at. So I think the tendency is for a lot of those offsides to happen in situations like that. But I think you'd always take people being aggressive and other offsides <laughs> there. If you notice, um, the Riverhawks will, right before the ball is played, they'll push their lineup all together. Yep. And that's where that offside trap happens, and that's how they're going to keep catching those runners. So what do you uh, – so as you're as – you're you know, as, as a midfielder and a defender, and you're seeing, you know, the, your 
your teammates go off sides like that? What kind of conversations are you having or what do you guys change up to try to fix that as, uh, you know, as that game progresses? Because I'm sure, you know, we've had, what, had three right now, I think, maybe even four um, offsides call so far. Um, you know, as a midfielder, I'm sure you're, you know, trying to play that ball in and, and being aggressive here as Duax gets a nice ball here. Goalie tries to come out but decides against that. Duax got Our a lot post, of room yep. here. That's an easy put in for this right foot for the second goal for the Jaguars. Goal, Ty Duax. We'll come back to that question in just a few no, seconds. No, you're here, fine. Right? But I, I think that is something that, uh, you know, that you want to discuss with those forwards. But Ty Duax with the second goal. That comes at the 13th minute of the first half. Jags up 2-0. to zero. Nice commanding lead for them as uh, Duax just timed that pass perfectly and uh, just was one-on-one -on -one with the goalkeep, and, and he had a whole right side of the net to try to decide where he was going to put that one, and he just put that one away fairly easily. As Riverhawks put it back into play, some one-on-one -on -one, uh, moves there, but... Uh, Duax gets called for a foul. It'll be a free kick as he holds his hands up in consternation with the referee. Yeah, so back to that. So do you have conversations with them or do you just let them keep running and, and hopefully they, they figure it out? Because, you know, they, they've got to have that on their mind when they keep getting called for it. But Right. I think a lot of times as a defender, you're constantly communicating with your forwards and just if they don't see it, a lot of times I would say to my forwards, you know, hey, watch their line. They're pushing it up. It's an offside trap. So you, what you want to do is you want those forwards to check into that space underneath and get played to. And then you want to have like an outside back or an outside mid overlapping that run outside. So making that run up the line to really catch that defensive line on off guard and then get someone through. So see like that third man running. Yep. Yep. Right down instead of congesting up the middle area. As the Mo River Hawks send that one out of bounds, it'll be a throw in very deep in the uh, offensive possession here, offensive zone for the Jaguars. Yeah, because I think there's, you know, it, it's it's not just the forwards. It's a it's a it's a two way street on those getting the passes in there right and at the right time. Absolutely. You know, sometimes you can wait too long for that pass when that when that uh, when you see that uh, forward making that run. So it's a two way street on making sure that those offsides don't happen. But it's uh, yeah, you're exactly right about all the communication. There's a good good example of it right there. That give and go on the outside. That defender was going with them, so they were ready to go. As they try to get a center in here, is going to try to get a center, but a defender's there to hit that ball, and it goes out of the backside of the pitch. It'll be a goal kick for the Riverhawks. As we have a couple substitutions, number four, number 15, and number 22 coming in for the Riverhawks. That is Carter Prince. Number 22 is Nikita Kachev. And what was the other number 13, I believe? I think that's uh, Dylan Jelly. For substitutions for the River Hawks and uh, for the Jaguars, for that matter, as well. Two to zero lead for the Jaguars. About 15 minutes into the first half here. We were kind of discussing, uh, Kenzie, before the game, this 2-0 uh, lead is kind of an infamous one. And I did not know this, but I think you and Andy had discussed this in your last, uh, last broadcast you did. And then I think Andy had talked to somebody else uh, about this as well. Like, what are the... What are the pitfalls of this 2-0 two, two lead like this? So I think the 2-0 is called technically the most dangerous lead in soccer for teams just because it's a point where you're up 2-0. There's a good chance, you know, some of your subs that maybe don't get as much time might come in, and there's a good chance that the overall feeling on the team might be, okay, the game's over, we're done. And I think that's where things get dangerous is when you kind of turn it off and you – get relaxed so to speak and I think that's when teams can come back and sneak back in and end up tying or winning the game absolutely so what is what's the what's the thing that you guys focus on in situations like this do you is it just about getting that next goal or is it uh you know what do you guys focus on to kind of uh, get out of that uh, most dangerous spot I think when I was at Grandview a lot of the time spent on defense was just maintaining our defensive shape and maintaining being able to build from the back and hold possessions and continue to create opportunities to score. Yep, absolutely. As he launches the ball back here from about the 10 yards from the back end, and he sends it abruptly out of bounds. 
It'll be a throw in for the Jags, which they take quickly. Not the uh, free kick that you're hoping for there from your goalkeep. Got a Mason City player down a little bit. Looks like he's going to be getting back up. It's, a, it's about to say a nice little connection between Jag passers there, but they do give up possession, but do get it back here at the midfield. Do actually a nice little touch, gets the ball down and sends it over the top of the crossbar. Nice little uh, piece of uh, control there by him, chesting that ball down to get it back down to his foot, but just wasn't uh, over the top of the ball enough to get that on frame and sent it over the top of the, of the uh, goal box there. I think Duax definitely is kind of the lifeblood, the the uh, the engine of that offense out there. You can definitely see every, everything goes through him one way or another. Highly skilled player and fun to watch. Shape's been pretty good so far. I've been impressed, like uh, like I said, from the game I already saw this year. These guys are spreading out quite a bit more, using up a lot of the space, cycling the ball back to uh, stretch that to stretch that defense out, not letting them uh, really sit on that uh, back line. But the Riverhawks are kind of okay with sitting on that back line, it looks like to me, as they send the ball through. Nice little centering pass. Oh. And the goalkeeper just gets enough of that ball as – Logan Page, senior forward, almost gets a touch on that ball to put it into the back of the uh, net. It'll be a goal kick for the Riverhawks. And it looks like Centennial has changed to a three-back as well. So you want to kind of explain that, Kenzie, like what you're talking about? Yeah, so instead of having four defenders in their back line, it looks like they've moved to a three player back line so it's looking to me like they have a three four three maybe sometimes it's kind of hard to tell yep. um but that's just gonna put more people more numbers forward to continue building from the back and creating those opportunities when teams are finding that they're not spending a lot of time in their defensive third, then they'll typically go to a three back to get more numbers yeah. forward. Yep. So that takes away a defender on that back line, but what they've kind of established is they feel comfortable enough in that back line that they think they can cover it with a third, uh, with three back there, maybe even usually utilizing the goalie a little bit to mm -hmm. help with the cycles across the back. Um, and then that allows them to get a, one more number into the offensive kind of uh, attack which is usually a midfielder. Is that usually how it works? Uh, yep. Typically, you could bring a center back up to a holding midfielder position. You could also pull an outside back up into an outside midfielder position if you wanted to. It just kind of depends on the personnel you have on nice the field. Nice pass to the outside. Shot on goal. That's the third goal for the Jaguars. I believe that was number seven was the De La Cuba with the first attack. And then we're looking for a number on the outside of who got that goal. It was that far forward, but he is not showing his number here at all here. He's just walking sideways. He's not going to show us his number, Kenzie, is he? He's <laughs> I wish they walk. would know that we were looking. He was just going to walk sideways here. All he needs to do is just uh, turn one way or the other. It's a single digit there. Is that maybe Isaac Kenninger again? Andrew Kruger with the goal, number five. Obviously, the PA announcers got better eyes than I don't know how he read that. I don't know either. Oh, they signal it up to them from the uh, bench, so they're cheating over there. So I see how it works. <laughs> so so far we got goals from. Hey, start your clock, over there. Kenzie ad astutely notices that the clock's not running here, but they get that running again. That's a former competitor out there. Making sure <laughs> that the, uh, the officials got things right here as they restart that clock. We're going to add about another 10 seconds on to the uh, half here for both teams. So we got a goal from Kenninger. I think he got that first goal, did he not? And then we got one from Kruger. And then we got one from Duak. So three goals for the Jaguars.
Mason City with a nice little bit of possession. Nice That's little overlap ball. there. Nice run. Tries to center the ball, but didn't get enough of it and sends it out of the back of the pitch. It'll be a goal kick for the Jaguars. Nice patience from the Jaguar back line there, trying to get it to uh, some open space to get this offense going and then uh, miss a little bit of a pass, but Duax tries to clean it up, but is not able to. Jackson Milik, sophomore midfielder for the River Hawks, uh, ricochets it off of a Jaguar defender and it goes out of bounds. Number 24, number eight, entering the game. That's Bayunda for the Jaguars. Look at see what that other number was. I think it was 24, and I don't even have a 24 on my roster here, so I'm not sure who 24 is and just got into the game. We'll have producer Andy check and see who that is so I can get a name on that, but 24 just entered the game. That's a foul on the Jaguars. It'll be a free kick. Not a bad position here at about, oh, about 30 yards out here for the uh, Riverhawks. That's going to be one of their first set pieces of the uh, night. Yeah, that's a pretty good look on goal there. It could, obviously could be better, but I think this is a kind of a deal where, you know, there's not going to be much of a wall in front of you as the Jaguars set up that two-man wall. Especially if it's wet, you get that ball bouncing in the box. Yep. Anything could happen. Exactly. When that uh, goal is used to playing a bounce a certain way and it skips because of some spin on the ball and the wetness, it can definitely go awry for their confidence on where that ball is going to be going. Caleb Murray with some control there, number 17, taking it up through the midfield, drops it off. Brock Brazil with a the touch. They send a ball in. It's going to be a nice little run here for the Jaguars as they send an additional goal in there. That's going to be number seven, Lucas De La Cuba with the goal. They had two guys there where really could have, either one of them could have taken that ball, but De La Cuba was the first one to get a touch on that. I think that is number seven over there, is it not? It was him, yes. Yep. Okay. Thought I saw that one pretty clearly on that time, but I was wrong on the first goal as well. So De La Cuba with the first uh, goal for him this for the tonight. That puts a 4-0 lead uh, for the Jaguars. But a nice little look for the Jaguars there. Like I said, there could have been either either individual that got that ball. It easily could have skipped over to the other guy and was in ex almost exactly the same position to get a scoring attempt on that. Yeah, it's definitely better to have two runners there than none. Yep. <laughs> but Yundel with a nice little move down the sidelines. Going to be an offside call. Are they gonna, not going to call it? He's going to call, and then he wasn't going to call it, so I don't know what he's doing here. They but think his other guy, ooh. Takes a shot. That but was the goalie, close. Yeah, goalie makes a nice little stop there and some really close quarters there. It kind of slips through his fingers, but he had enough of a touch on that that it kind of – just stopped right on the goal line. He's able to corral it and uh, put it back into play. I think what happened there was 24 was offsides, but Duax was not. And 24 peeled off enough. Yep. To, to so not 24 be, didn't be touch the, the ball. Play. So. Because he definitely stopped right on that uh -huh. offsides. That usually is an indicator of that flag's going to get raised up. But uh, he kind of like hesitated then as the AR hesitated just that little bit to go down. And then he started going down. Head coach Brian Duax uh, here as the uh, father of uh, Ty Duax, the forward. 
the coach for the Jaguars uh, has got to be really excited about this start uh, in the first half with still 14 minutes left to go and a 4-0 lead for the Jaguars. The River Hawks are coached by Brian DeGabriel. DeGabriel. Looks like he's got a son, number 10, uh, Drew DeGabriel, on the team as well. May not be a son, but at least somebody related, most likely. <laughs> Now, Kenzie, we hear that, that, that bench talking a lot, right? You can, we can hear them. Uh, um, Ethan Sex, Sexto? Okay. Yeah. Ethan Sexto, number 24, is uh, who's into the game. We didn't uh, have them on the roster, but uh, just want to get him uh, called out. Ooh. Oh, as I was talking about Kenzie with the co with the with the bench yelling. I mean, they're they're talking about defenders coming in and how valuable is that for those players on the field to to have the involvement of the bench. Uh, you know, kind of communicating with them, kind of letting them know what's going on sometimes. Yeah, they can definitely be an extra set of eyes, especially if you know there's someone coming from behind you, and usually your teammates should be communicating that. But sometimes, if you know it's not loud enough, sometimes your bench is louder, and just overall, especially coming from a girl sport, a woman's sport side of things. Um, just overall encouragement, I think, goes on both sides too. Yep. Um, super important from your teammates. Well, it just keeps you involved in the game as well. So when you know when that when your number is called. Oh, absolutely. You know, i.e., you know, you being you know down at that uh, big tournament down in uh, uh, the eastern side of Iowa. You know that uh, you're ready to go and know what's going on by staying involved in the game. You're ready to go and, and step in and, and make an impact. Definitely. Do acts with a couple touches. He grabs his hip there as they Riverhawks keep that in bounds and send it upfield. Going to be a foul call there, but it looks like he's going to be calling uh, advantage. I advantage, think advantage. Yep, as uh, the Riverhawks move it down the field. Yeah, the referee signifies the foul by pointing at the spot of the foul but then usually raises the other hand to show that they are in an advantage position as they move down the field. So what he's uh, thinking there is he doesn't want to stop the play as that offense advances down the field. And, uh, you know, there's kind of a little period that he, he will kind of hold on to that foul and put it in his pocket for a few seconds there as he watches that advantage kind of either dissipate or keep going and then, and then you know, removes that foul at that point. I think I'm kind of describing that right. Is that, would that be yes, right, Kenzie? Yes, you're yeah. right. Have some substitutions coming in for the Riverhawks. Get some fresh legs in here with that 4-0 lead. They definitely are... Gonna have to be moving the rest of the night here, trying to uh, keep defending. Sexto with a nice pass into number seven. It's De La Cuba. So he gets a centering pass, but it's knocked out of bounds. That'll be a corner kick for the Jaguars. Corner kicks this year are brought to you by Iowa Rush at IowaRush.com. Clinics, teams, leagues, all sorts of things. Soccer going on here in Ankeny with uh, Iowa Rush. Be sure to reach out to them. The Jags take that one short, send that ball in. Couple attackers moving in. Shot on goal. De La Cuba takes another shot off goal. Goes off of a defender. It'll be another corner kick for the Jaguars. Now, Kenzie, I you know usually you see these set pieces sending it into the box, looking for people to head it. And so, what is the change when they decide to take these short? The short corner can really draw out defenders before you put the ball into the box, um, or it can also just give you a different angle to hit the ball in. So sometimes what they'll do is if you, if they don't send anyone out, any defenders out for the short corner, a lot of times that person that's receiving the ball will end up just taking a shot because they're at a more advantageous angle. Yep. They're at yep. a better angle to take that shot for the far post. And typically going to be a little bit closer as well. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to be advancing, especially if they don't defend that short corner. Yep. And that usually just happens the first time. And then they realize it's send another defender out of there, yep. but, but does open up that, um, 
uh, that box as well as you send people in there. It takes out an offensive player and a defender and pulls them to the uh, corner. Absolutely. As we get a foul there, it'll be a free kick for the Jaguars. That's Isaac Kenninger, one of our goal scorers. He goes down hard. Looks like he's going to go ahead and step off. They'll be bringing in number 16, Mason Goble, sophomore at Vinfield or forward. Be coming in for that uh, that injury. I think that you probably should have looked at the referee a little bit and let him know you're stepping off for an injury because uh, – he just kind of like moseyed onto the bench, and the other guy just kind of jumped in, but maybe that's the way that works. So Ty, Ty Duax is here to take the free kick. He sends that ball in. Nice ball. Nicely weighted. It drops down, but the goal keeps it right there. Just gobble that one. Eric, Mc, Eric Farland with the save. Yeah, Mason City is going to have to keep these substitutions coming in because uh, they're uh, some of these players on the field and even on the sidelines are definitely gassed as they're having to chase these Jaguars all over the field right now. Absolutely, especially at the beginning of April. You are no way near midseason form with your fitness levels. That's probably going to go for both teams there too. It's absolutely, uh, you know, obviously you're going to run harder when you're you're winning four to zero a little bit to you know keep pouring it on. But, uh, you know, you're still expending that energy. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see some more um, substitutions for the Jaguars as well as we advance further into this game. I don't know if you got that one out of the side out of bounds or it went out the back. Looking looks. for a call. Looks like maybe a corner kick. No, they're going to be a throw in. I think it's a throw, yep. About seven minutes left to go here in the first half. Seven, or Four to zero lead for the Jaguars. We got goal scores from Kenninger, Kruger, De La Cuba, and Duax. Kind of nice to see that they're spreading that scoring around too early in the season here as well. We know that Duax is going to be a scorer throughout the rest of the year as well, but to see some contributions from the other other forwards and even a defender with uh, with Kenninger getting that first goal, it's uh, going to be a positive thing for the Jaguars to see, something they can build on for sure. I was a defender at Grandview. Did you uh, get to score any goals in that situation? I scored some PKs. PKs, nice. I started as a midfielder, and I scored one goal my freshman year. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, those forwards just uh, take all the glory away from everybody, right? They, they, uh, midfielders and defenders just look for those assists in uh, order to kind of pad their stats and some – the clean sheets. I think we got a first card of the game. Looks like the referee's looking for one here. I think he's going to show a card here. Maybe. Yep. Yeah. We're going to give a card. Looks like to number four. So he's going to have to exit the field. That's Carter Prince, junior midfielder. I think they really just got their legs kind of tang tangled up there. But uh, I think maybe the referee's looking at maybe as a um, as a kind of stalled the offensive drive there, and that's maybe what drove the card rather than the actual foul. Yeah, and also just to set a standard, especially as the conditions get worse, to keep control of the game and not let things get sloppy. People get hurt. Yep. Now, how does that rule work with yellow cards in, in high school, Kenzie? So what, what happens when you get a yellow card? So in high school, two yellow cards are a red card, but the first yellow you get, you have to sit. It used to be 10 minutes. When I was in high school, it was 10 minutes. They shortened it to five. So they just have to sit for five minutes, and then they can come back on. And there's no disadvantage in that. They're able to replace that player, but that player specifically just uh, kind of sits in the penalty box, but they're able to replace that player. Yep. So it's not yep. – there's no advantage in the in the, um, in the uh, number of people on the field like there is sometimes in, in uh, you know, higher-level soccer. Right. But uh, interesting little shot there from uh, number two. That's uh, Brock Brazo. That's a little set-piece uh, kick there. He kind of just drove it along the ground and uh, tried to sneak it around that goalie, but the goalie was prepared for that one. We 
And kind of the reason, Kenzie, I brought up that goal scoring for the defenders and the midfielders. It's like Kenninger gets his goal in an early season game. He's going to be pretty excited because uh, that's usually not something that happens a, a ton for uh, for those uh, defenders in the back line, playing the back line, but uh, was able to get that goal into the back of the net. I'm sure he's going to be really excited about uh, having that tally up on his scoreboard for this season. Yeah, you're definitely right. It's Those can be hard to come by for those defensive players. But they definitely still do a lot of work to keep things rolling. It's a new entry into the game. That's Nicholas De La Cuba, number 14, with some touches there in the midfield. A lot of siblings, it looks like, on the Centennial exactly, roster. Exactly, yeah. The Brazil brothers, the De La Cubas. That's all I kind of noticed, but uh, it doesn't happen a ton where you have a varsity team that has two sets of brothers on there. That Brazil name's a, you know, a name synonymous with soccer here in the Metro for a lot of years with their father being an assistant coach. Daryl Brazil has been a, uh, a constant uh, figure in the girls' soccer, high-level soccer side uh, for what last 15 years probably maybe even maybe even a little bit more a little bit less than that yeah i'd say about the last 15 years or yeah. so coach for numerous clubs around the city nice little opportunity there it looked like uh 24 ethan sexto with the touch there but wasn't able to uh, get it on frame it goes off the edge and it'll be a goal kick for the river hawks Eric Farland putting the ball back into play again. Yeah, that defensive line for the Jaguars is pushing almost up to midfield now. They're definitely able to uh, put some pressure on the uh, River Hawks to keep them completely in their offensive zone right now. You can really see that three-man back line that you were talking about. Kenzie has mm -hmm. a great uh, astute uh, observation there. It'll be offsides. Looked like he was indecisive almost again there on whether he was going to call it. Yeah, he did, and I'm not sure why because 24 was way behind the <laughs> yep, defensive yep. line. Well, I think Sexto kind of like – I think he knew he was offsides, and he might have even hesitated to go he after He might have. That. I think so too. Been, that may have been the key that the uh, referee kind of saw. And if he would have let it go, then the ball would have still been in play. Nice little uh, change of possession here for the uh, Riverhawks as they try to get something going here with a nice little cross but not able to get a good connection. They steal the ball back. They have a Ooh. shot that goes off of the side of the frame, but the Jaguars get that out of there. It'll be a throw-in for the Riverhawks with their one of their first shots on goal of the match here. With just about a minute left to go here in the first half. That was a good look. Just it unlucky. It was a good look. Bounce off the crossbar there. And that even that first initial attack there, they kind of got they kind of got stopped, but then got that ball back and then got that shot on goal. And it was a just a game of inches on that one on whether that one was going to score. Or completely missed the uh, standard uh, as well. Jags need to get things settled down here for this last uh, couple seconds of the first half and make sure they don't give up anything silly here as they uh, want to keep that 4-0 to zero lead going into the second half. Clean sheet for the goalie, Ben Nelson, or Andrew Nelson, rather. Ben Ridland sends that one out of bounds. Looks like he's one of the Jaguar captains. As they send a ball in there, and I uh, thought Nelson was going to maybe step out of that uh, goalkeep and touch that ball. But that brings us to the end of the first half. It's a 4-0 lead for the Jaguars over the Mason City Riverhawks. We'll be back in a few minutes with some word after some words from our sponsors. 
Freedom Tire is proud to be the title sponsor of supporting Jaguar student-athletes through Centennial Digital. With six locations around the metro, you're never far from getting you back or keeping your family safely on the road. Our certified staff and state-of-the-art technology means you can take comfort knowing you've got the best work at the best prices. Come see us at Freedom Tire, a proud supporter of Centennial Digital. I've been with U.S. Cellular for years now. They asked me to tell you about their special customer event, Us Days. Exclusive deals, like up to $1,200 for any new phone. So I said, if I'm going to be on TV, think I can get hair and makeup? And I even got a manicure, too. Us Days at U.S. Cellular. Get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. <laughs> Everything we do is here to benefit the client. Every decision that's needed to be made, the first question you should ask is, does this, does this benefit the client and is this the best thing for the client? Our goal is to make a difference. We have the tools, resources, training, and leadership to make a difference in our agents' lives and their careers. And then they can then take that to make a difference in their clients' lives and ultimately make a difference in our community. We are available basically 24-7 to make sure that our agents are getting the support they need um, to look like a million bucks in front of their clients. What if you could create memories that would last a lifetime? That would be pretty cool. Well, now you can. So when an athlete walks into Nick Garage Fitness, the one thing we want them to know is that this is a phenomenal community. We have the best coaching. We have the best technology. We have the, the programming that can help them succeed. So whether it's trying to get on JV for the first time, going to that next level on varsity, going from a, a second string to you know an all-state player, we have the tools, we have the, the programming and the coaching in order to take each individual to their next level. U.S. Cellular Prepaid lets you pick a plan that fits your needs. We don't deprioritize you like the other guys in their prepaid plans. With our great 5G network coverage that keeps you in the fast lane. Our 5G coverage is always along for the ride. Buy one month of service right now and get the second one free. U.S. Cellular. Built for us. West 40 Market in Uptown Ankeny is your place to shop for the best meats, steaks, brats, jerky, and everything in between. Let us be your one-stop shop for all your favorite cuts. All raised on local Iowa farms. Shopping local never tasted so good. Freedom Tire is proud to be the title sponsor of supporting Jaguar student-athletes through Centennial Digital. With six locations around the metro, you're never far from getting you back or keeping your family safely on the road. Our certified staff and state-of-the-art technology means you can take comfort knowing you've got the best work at the best prices. Come see us at Freedom Tire, a proud supporter of Centennial Digital. This is Austin Oliver coming back to you live from uh, North Ankeny. 
Uh, we're at Ankeny Stadium here with Kenzie Longstrat. Uh, got some scores from some of the other games that are going on tonight. Uh, the boys, Ankeny Hawks, are up a 1-0 over Waukee. We think that game is at halftime as well. Another one to just call in on. I think we got a 2-0 lead for the uh, Centennial girls up over Urbandale. And I think the the girls game at Cedar Falls for the Hawkettes uh, was canceled tonight. So they uh, would not be playing. That was a turf, or that was a grass field up in Cedar Falls. So that they canceled that game due to the uh, weather conditions. What a weird day of weather, too. I mean, I looked uh, out uh, early this morning, Kenzie, and I saw rain. And then I looked up about 15 minutes later, and it was a full-blown snow snowstorm. And then tonight uh, we had a pretty clear, clear start to the game, and then all of a sudden it uh, started raining, and it kind of changed over to some sleety weather. And uh, we've had four goals in this first half. What kind of things did you see in that first half that were going well for the Jaguars? I definitely saw a lot of switching the point of attack, you know, changing from attacking to, from the left side to the right side, moving the ball through the back end. Um, Keeping possession, especially in that final third, has led to a lot of opportunities, a lot of scoring opportunities for the Jags. I definitely think they need to keep that up as they continue to move into the second half. Yep. I think uh, the other positive we talked about already in that first half was seeing the goal scoring kind of spread out over the whole, whole team. We've got goals from Isaac Kenninger, um, Andrew uh, Kruger. Had on Kenninger there was the one that started the game off off of uh, a set piece as the defender moving up. Uh, De La Cuba scored. And then Ty Duax, uh, not surprisingly, has scored as well. So uh, great to see a 4-0 lead for the Jaguars. We've got about three minutes, three and a half minutes left to go before we'll come back for the uh, start of the second half. We'll be back with you in just a few moments. Freedom Tire is proud to be the title sponsor of supporting Jaguar student-athletes through Centennial Digital. With six locations around the metro, you're never far from getting you back or keeping your family safely on the road. Our certified staff and state-of-the-art technology means you can take comfort knowing you've got the best work at the best prices. Come see us at Freedom Tire, a proud supporter of Centennial Digital. I've been with U.S. Cellular for years now. They asked me to tell you about their special customer event, Us Days. Exclusive deals, like up to $1,200 for any new phone. So I said, if I'm going to be on TV, think I can get hair and makeup? And I even got a manicure, too. Us Days at U.S. Cellular. Get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. <laughs> Everything we do is here to benefit the client. Every decision that's needed to be made, the first question you should ask is, does this, does this benefit the client and is this the best thing for the client? Our goal is to make a difference. We have the tools, resources, training, and leadership to make a difference in our agents' lives and their careers. And then they can then take that to make a difference in their clients' lives and ultimately make a difference in our community. We are available basically 24-7 to make sure that our agents are getting the support they need um, to look like a million bucks in front of their clients. What if you could create memories that would last a lifetime? That would be pretty cool. Well, now you can. So when an athlete walks into Nick Garage Fitness, the one thing we want them to know is that this is a phenomenal community. We have the best coaching. We have the best technology. We have the, the programming that can help them succeed. So whether it's trying to get on JV for the first time, going to that next level on varsity, going from a, a second string to you know an all-state player, we have the tools, we have the, the programming and the coaching in order to take each individual to their next level.
U.S. Cellular Prepaid lets you pick a plan that fits your needs. We don't deprioritize you like the other guys in their prepaid plans. With our great 5G network coverage that keeps you in the fast lane. Our 5G coverage is always along for the ride. Buy one month of service right now and get the second one free. U.S. Cellular. Built for us. West 40 Market in Uptown Ankeny is your place to shop for the best meats, steaks, brats, jerky, and everything in between. Let us be your one-stop shop for all your favorite cuts. All raised on local Iowa farms. Shopping local never tasted so good. Freedom Tire is proud to be the title sponsor of supporting Jaguar student-athletes through Centennial Digital. With six locations around the metro, you're never far from getting you back or keeping your family safely on the road. Our certified staff and state-of-the-art technology means you can take comfort knowing you've got the best work at the best prices. Come see us at Freedom Tire, a proud supporter of Centennial Digital. Well, we just went back into play for the second half. Just missed about three seconds of the match here as the Riverhawks just sent a long ball down. Trying to get uh, some action going for them. Kids, we kind of saw some little bit of uh, signs of life for the Riverhawks offense there right at the end of the uh, second half. Is that anything they can build on for the second half? I think if they keep those attacks and they're smart about them, I definitely think Centennial has the defense to get numbers behind the ball and defend most of the time. But I definitely, I mean... No team is perfect, especially in the second week of April, first week of April. Um, I think if they have those well-timed attacks and they use, you know, the rain to their advantage, they could definitely get some goals in. Yeah. They sent one off of uh, the side of the uh, frame there, right, uh, probably with about uh, two minutes left to go in the half. As they try to move the ball up the field and give up some possession here. Duax has a nice little touchback and sends it in. Uh, goalie comes out, makes a nice play on it. Eric Farland with the save, senior goalkeeper. Puts the ball back into play and sends it abruptly out of bounds. Andrew Kruger sends the ball back into play. Well, I think the hopes of the Riverhawks to get some early attacking time here, like we were just talking about, Kenzie, has kind of uh, not really been realized here as the Jags have just gotten possession and just kind of driven it right into their offensive zone and have pretty much kept it there uh, for the whole start of this uh, first two minutes of the half here for the Jaguars. They've done a nice job of keeping the ball in their half. They're still out with that three back, it looks like. It looks like they have two holding midfielders. Crowd's getting excited about something. I'm not sure exactly what they're yelling about, but uh, maybe they're just getting excited to stay a little bit warm here <laughs> as it has cooled down a little bit, but still not a bad night for uh, for soccer here if they if you can stay dry. Duax uh, has a nice little, couple little moves but gives up possession. And then the uh, Riverhawk forward immediately has four Jaguars pretty much surrounding him, so there's no place for him to go. J.P. Miles trucking out there for the Riverhawks, trying to get uh, some pressure on that ball to make a mistake. But the uh, Jaguars are patient as they move it to the outside of the far side of the field. Singing into 17, Caleb Murray. He's definitely been a crucial part of them being able to attack and switch the point of attack as they've made those key plays and scored those goals. Yeah, Andrew Kruger did a nice job of uh, watching that pass and uh, adjusting his uh, kind of his approach to how he's going to be kicking that. So he had a good angle to be able to do a cross and sent a nice ball in. There just wasn't anybody there to get on the end of it. Uh, and the even the goalie had a hard time kind of uh, corralling that one as well. Just 
Bo Brazil chasing this one down. So let's talk about that whole holding midfield that we were talking about. Kind of like number 17 or I think on the far side maybe number 6 or I think maybe number summer 6. Well, right, 17 is doing it right now. So let's talk about him. So as those defenders, you got those three on the back line. As one of them starts to move up, I noticed him starting to move back and taking that that position. Is that uh, So that holding midfielder has kind of got an offensive mindset but also has to be able to seesaw almost immediately and go to a defensive mindset as well. Yes, yeah, so when you are – Defending at any point, you always kind of talk about having a triangle around the ball. So if the center back is closer to the player attacking, then the center back will move up and the holding midfielder will go back just to kind of recreate that triangle that's then formed with the outside back just yeah. to give numbers around the ball defensively. Yeah, so number six is that holding midfielder right now. That was the other person I was kind of looking yep. for. So we got 17 and six that are both uh, kind of trading off on the positioning of that uh, uh, holding midfielder. As uh, 19, Logan Page uh, chases that one down on the far side, sends it in, but gets the ball back. He's going to be looking to get that ball into the center, but uh, loses possession. Riverhawks try to make a connection, but uh, the defense of the Jaguars steps up. And that holding midfielder right there takes that ball and sends it along the way on that back three. Nice piece of footwork there by number seven, De La Cuba, as he uh, kind of gets through a couple defenders there and does it all by himself well, with some great ball control with the inside of his foot and the toe of his foot, trying to control that ball and get it through those defenders. Foul on number 17, Murray, as he just kind of runs down the back of one of the offensive players. Looks like Carter Prince. From the Riverhawks uh, draws that foul and it'll be a free kick for the Riverhawks. Now this uh, these free kicks, Kenzie, he's got to make a decision on you know making a connecting pass or sending that ball all the way down. What kind of goes into some of those decisions, uh, like where you're going to be taking that ball? Is that a call that the coach makes uh, previous to that free kick, or is that kind of the discretion of that uh, person taking that free kick? It's kind of up to them and what the team has practiced, but. We got another goal That's there, goal, yeah. trying to get a number on there. I think it's number six, I believe, or is that number five? I think it was five. Number five. That's Andrew Kruger with his second goal of the night. It was a nice little pass that uh, just kind of dribbled all the way across the field there, and uh, and Kruger was just there to be able to take a touch and put that right into the back of the net. Yep, that's number five, number uh, number two for him for the night. That puts the lead up five to zero for the Jaguars as the Riverhawks. Put the ball back into play. So, kids, we got a we got abruptly interrupted by a goal there on that uh, <laughs> on that decision, but with an offsides call here for Mason City. But uh, yeah, so is it so that uh, that the person taking the free kick is kind of making that decision yeah, on their own there. Yeah, they'll decide, and typically you just want to get the ball up the field out of your defensive third, which is why typically they'll go for those long balls, but there are times where it's better to play through feet too. Yep. So you're just looking at the options as you set up to take that free kick and see what the best option is then, kind of Definitely. what you're saying. Yeah. We see the uh, slick feel kind of coming into play there on that player, Kenzie, as we – had a player trying to make a quick turn and uh, fit, went out from underneath them and it trickled out of bounds. Is uh, have a little bit of a tackle football going on at uh, about halfway into the Jaguar offensive zone and it's uh, number seven is going to be called for a foul. That's De La Cuba. He'll be given the foul and it'll be a free kick once again for the Riverhawks as he surveys that field trying to make that decision on whether he's going to take it long. I got 23 right here that could be an opening to get that ball up the field but he does choose to take it long. Near the end of the first 10 minutes of the second second half into the 50th minute of the match.
There's the uh, wet field coming into play again. Is uh, had a swing and a miss on one of the midfielders, and then we had a player oh, go yep. down. Tripped over one of the uh, yard lines uh, there in the middle of the field. We usually call that the turf monster. Yep. Reached up and grabbed him as he was trying to <laughs> make a play on that ball. Just went right down. Strong ball played into Brock Brazil. He looks for options, and the uh, Mesa City defender sends that ball out of the back of the pitch. It'll be a corner kick for the Jaguars. I think it'll be the fourth or fifth corner kick for them. Uh, these are sponsored by Iowa Rush at iowarush.com. Is that just me, or does that look like it's a long ways away from that flag? I was looking at the corners and trying to see if they had had opened up a little bit, but that looked like he was significantly far away from that flag to me. As is that what it is? Okay, that's probably what it is. As we're uh, going to take a corner kick from the other side now, as Ty Duak steps up to take this one. Now, Kenzie, do you have different people that take? Uh, kicks from each of the different corners is that something that, that they even consider so typically on so when you're so for the jags right now on the corner on the far side you want a left-footed person to take mm -hmm. it got it because you want that ball to curve in toward the goal perfect and then on the other side you want oh sorry no on the far side right now you want a right footed person and on the closest side to us right now you want a left-footed person to take it yep so you're looking to create a, a curve for that yep. ball to go in that would uh go out from the goal, but then on the end would come back towards the goal and, and be a, a pressure situation to that goalie. Yep. As we see another opportunity for the Jags, and he takes a shot, and the goalkeeper does a nice job of getting just one hand on that ball, and it goes out of bounds. It'll be another goal kick here for the Jaguars. They take that one quickly this time. Duak sends it in. Nice ball. Little header there. Puts it in the ball into a dangerous position. Ricochets around, but the Riverhawks get it out, and they go on a little bit of a counterattack here as uh, they try to push forward. But the Jaguars do a good job of stopping that counterattack. Nicely timed run there from Duak, staying on size. He sends it into center position. Riverhawks are trying to get that ball out of the offensive zone, but there just seems to be jag after jag there to uh, keep that ball in their, in their side of the zone. Got 10, 29, and 9 coming into the game for the River Hawks. That is Brody Lee coming into the game. That is Jose Abregon coming into the game. And that is Drew DeGabriel coming into the game for the River Hawks. Nice little bit of passing there by the Jaguars as they were able to uh, move that ball within about a 10-yard 10, 10 radius there about six or seven times to get themselves some space. As the whole Jaguar bench goes out to start to get warmed up, we could see some substitutions coming in for their part with this 5-0 to zero lead with uh, still about 28 minutes left to go here in the second half. Jaguars moving it up the field. Ty Duax draws a foul. This is going to be a even more dangerous kind of a position. The uh, Riverhawks are probably going to have to set up a three or four man wall to uh, prevent uh, an easy shot into goal here from Duax. I think from this position, is Duax going to be looking for a pass to somebody else or to put a ball in, or is he going to be looking to score in at this distance? I think he could drive it to score. I think he could also play a nice lofted ball like that to get over the wall, if it were to get over the wall. Yeah. That happens. Yep, a little short on that. Soccer is a fickle sport in that way, that uh, you can hit probably uh, 10 of those in practice and get over that wall every time, and then sometimes in the game it just uh, doesn't go the way you want it. And Absolutely. Makes you look a little bit silly sometimes. Yes. I mean, it even happens in the pros, you know, you – those guys tee those balls up, and uh, they missed the goal by 20 yards. Oh, yeah. A 
they make it look easy on TV, but when you really get down there and have to uh, take those shots, it's a whole different ball game. It definitely is. Be a Riverhawk throw in. I think you kind of said it too, uh, Kenzie, number 17. He's kind of played that pivotal role of uh, just keeping everybody um, comfortable and in, in the right positions there as that holding midfielder. Um, he's just been a big part of uh, kind of setting up some of these runs that have been happening. He may not make, be making that final assist pass, but uh, he's definitely a big part of uh, how those plays are starting out from the middle middle there. Yeah, I've kind of been watching him, even just his movement off the ball and just the his awareness I mean, he can receive the ball from a defender and immediately know what's behind him and switch the point of attack, which can really throw a defense off, and it's definitely contributed to a lot of the goals that have been scored tonight. Kind of one of those unsung positions. You know, they, they, they're not the uh, glitzy position, but uh, nothing really works without them doing their job. Definitely. Duax uh, lays a nice little ball, ball to the outside. Ooh, nice That's driven ball grab. there, yeah. Kayla Murray, or wait, that was uh, number 19, I believe. Uh, yeah, Logan Page on the far side just uh, had a nice little pull with the pull with his toe to get uh, the ability to get a shot on goal, but the goal was in the goalkeeper was in exactly the right spot to uh, stop that one. Well driven though. Yes, it definitely was. It was a good near post look. Not a whole lot you can do when you're that close to the goal, other yep. than. Hit it hard and try to get it away from the keeper. It looks like Mason City's almost gone to a five man back line. Yep. <laughs> it looks like maybe they, I mean, I think it's probably still a four, but we've got a fifth one that's kind of dropping back and covering one of those forwards that's pushing right up to the line as well. Nelson's able to come pretty far out here. You don't see the uh, goalkeeper being able to step out to almost midfield to uh, help with the offensive setup as Duax gets a nice little pass. He's going to put that one in the back of the net as well. Another goal for the Jaguars. Ty Duax with his second goal of the night. That brings, brings the tally up to six goals for the Jaguars to zero for the Riverhawks. Nice little bit of work there. Just was very patient as he had made that attack and was able to just put it into the back of the net. Definitely what you expect from a senior attacker. Yes, good composure as well. It can be hard sometimes when the keeper's rushing at you. He definitely got taken out at the end of the play too after he did score that ball. He's kind of gingerly walking up the feet. It looks like your field kind of looks like he's maybe holding an arm or maybe a hip. I'm not sure which. Looks like he's fine, but uh, probably took a pretty hard shot there. Got some life for the Riverhawk offense. That's Noah Ruiz sending the ball in. Does run out of bounds, so it'll be a Jaguar throw in. Ben Ridlin looking over the field. De La Cuba pressuring and then decides to pull back out, gets it to Ridlin. Ridlin sends it over to Murray. It's a good look to change the change the picture a little bit there. Yep, definitely uh, open up that field quite a bit as they send that in. The goalie's able to come up and get a play on that. Eric Farland. Murray sends that ball in. De La Cupa with a few touches. Go at do acts with another goal. And no offsides on that. I thought it was going to be pretty close to being offsides, mm -hmm. but he was able to stay on sides and uh, puts another one into the back of the net. It's a 7-0 lead with Ty Duax's third goal of the match. He hits it with a hat trick. 
Very smooth connections leading up to that goal. That was a pretty one. They just uh, very patient in that, yep. that attack and, and just too many people to cover and uh, too many outlets for that ball to go to and do actually able to just take that one and put it home. Got a lot of substitutions into the match now, so I'll try to get those uh, kind of keyed in here. Got Nicholas De La Cuba, number 14, into the match now. Got number 13, Arnel Islamovic, into the match. Number 9, Tyson Wordoff. Wordoff, yeah. Word He's in, yeah. That may be it so far here. I think we may have another forward that maybe has uh, come into the game as well, but uh, trying to see who that is out there. Offside call. It'll be coming back up. I think that guy on the uh, the uh, new guy on the far side there that's running up about the 40-yard line there that was going to be received, the one that was offside, I think that may be a newcomer to the game as well here. I think it might be number 11, but uh, I'm going to wait here to see what number that is. On the far side, those numbers are just small enough that make oh, yeah. it hard to see. Yeah. Yeah. Ball sent out of bounds by the River Hawks. It'll be a throw in for the Jaguars. We've got more subs coming in. Number eight to number 16 for the Jaguars. That's Bayunda, number eight. And number 16, Mason Goble. They played a little bit in the first half as well. And that's a throw in foul on Bayunda just into the game. He lifted up that back foot as he tossed that ball out. Got some wholesale changes on uh, Mason City side as well as number 15, Cam Bugen into the game. Number 19, Justin Nazaki, Nikazi, and number four, Carter Prince, and number 22, Nikita Kachev. Yeah, I think that far side guy out there is number 11. That'd be Caden Macfell. McPhail, a senior forward midfielder. Yeah, I think we got a good look at the back now. Yeah, definitely number 11. And I think we have a new goalie out there maybe too. No, I don't think the new goalie's gone out there yet. Looks like the new goalie may be coming in here shortly. He's got his gloves on. He's ready to go. Looks like Lucas Dar Derby is going to be finishing up a goal for the last uh, just under 20 minutes of the game. So with these reserves, what are they, you know, I, I think, you know, they're excited to be in here, but, uh, you know, what are you, what were you ever feeling as a reserve coming into a game like this? And, you know, what kind of impact did you want to have, uh, Kinsey, in situations like this? I definitely think when you come off the bench, it's important to keep the level high and maintain kind of the pace of the game that was already predetermined by the people who were on before you. Um, even just raising that level to just constantly being – knowing that, you know, yeah, you're coming off the bench, but you still have a role, you still have a purpose on the field, on the team. Um, just holding yourself to that high standard is really important. You know, look at it as an opportunity too, right? To, oh, yeah. You know, you, you always sit on that bench and be like, hey, I could do this better, you know, or do this differently than maybe somebody's out there on the field. And it gives you that opportunity to kind of put that, uh, kind of put your uh, mouth where your words are, your words where your mouth are at, or, you know, with your play out there and, and make you something happen for yourself with that opportunity. Absolutely. Riverhawks send that one out of bounds. 
That'll be a throw in for the Jaguars. They take it quickly. I think the other things they're kind of looking for is still having that cohesion, you know, between the uh, players. Hopefully these are players that maybe the second team, but they still play each, play with each other in practice. So they have a, usually have a good feeling with uh, with some of the other players that are out there so they can still have a decent connection, good communication from practicing together. Yeah, you definitely want to look for that too, just people who play well together. And sometimes some of your reserves will mesh better with some of your starters, and sometimes that can make a difference in a lineup too. Yep. So you are keeping a couple starters out there. Looks like they're keeping most of the defensive line in, uh, in as well. Um, you know, just I think to make sure that they have that constant to that similar defense that they've been playing for the rest of the game. Plus, you want to keep that clean sheet going as well. You definitely do. It's a bummer when uh, you know you get to the last few minutes and then give up a single goal when you've uh, had just a great night like this. It's not that big of a deal, but it's also a. Uh, I think a good statistic for your goalie to be able to hang their hat on to to come out of the game with a with a shutout and uh, just showing that you can play defense for 40 minutes, you know, consistently as well. For sure. Got a couple more subs coming in. Number 23 and 24. That's Ty Sexton, a freshman midfielder forward, and Ethan Sexto. He'll make another appearance. He was uh, also in for the first half. Exiting the game is Arlen Islamovic and Brock Brazo. Now, with substitutions, kids, there's no limit in high school, right? You can sub as much Correct. as you want. Yep, no limit in high school. Now, even in college, there is there limitations in college? And there subs? are limitations in college. So, in college, if you come out in the first half, you cannot go back in. Got it. Until the second half. And then if you go out in the second half, you can go back in. Gotcha. At least in NAIA. Got it. It might be different in NCAA. Yeah, so it's, it's a little bit more unique with the uh, than what you see maybe with the Olympics and Premier League on, yes. your, on your Saturday and Sunday mornings where, you know, you get two or three substitutions for the whole game. So, yep. you know, it's, it's definitely going to be a little bit more – Wholesale changes, and I think it just keeps the level of play very, very high when you're having, you know, people come in and able to get some people rested, you know, during the match and be able to come back in and make an impact as well. Definitely. Yeah, especially if you're one of those outside players who's expected, you know, your role is to constantly be up and down the field. That rest can be super critical, especially in these early season games where no one is really in that midseason form yet. Absolutely. So just winding down under 15 minutes left to go here in the second half. It's a 7-0 to zero lead for the Jaguars. A really complete looking looking showing tonight for the Jags. Uh, got a scoring from lots of different people. Ty Duax has uh, padded his, a, a couple more of goals onto his stats as well uh, for a hat trick here in this uh, early season game. Andy, do we know how many how many games have they had this year so far? They're one and three right now. Okay, gotcha. So this is the fifth game of the season. Got it. Yeah. So just kind of looking at that record, I think they definitely uh, needed a win like this to be able to give themselves some confidence uh, going into uh, the rest of their uh, schedule. Looks like you've got a couple other substitutions in for the Jaguars. Number twenty-one, Alan Majakovic. And then number uh, 18, Maddox Rash was okay. in as well. They both going in as defenders. Is that where we saw them coming at? I believe so, right? Yep. Yeah. It looks like maybe even tr number 12, Ben Ho, is also another defender that just entered into the game, playing a defender as well. Jaguars still doing a good job of holding possession in their offensive zone.
Crowd enjoying the play of uh, Bayunda there as he uh, tries to work some fancy footwork as trying to get around those defenders, but uh, eventually does give up possession and they send it down into the box for the Jaguars. Defensive line for the Jags moving it up the field. Ooh, ball there. trickles over there to Bayonda. Bayonda's Ooh, gonna get called off. for for offsides. Very, very close though. I think I thought he made a good run. I don't think he expected it to get all the way over to him. To, I don't uh, think he did either. Yeah. I think he just kind of looked down. He's like, holy cow, that pass is right here on top of me, and I got to get it, and was a little bit uh, too excited and got uh, ahead of that ball. Bayunda with some nice pressure. Mesa City Riverhawk defender is definitely feeling as he sends it back to one of his compatriots to uh, send it down the field. Long pass. Headed back into the offensive zone for the Jaguars. That's Nicholas De La Cuba. Nice little battle going on here with Bayuna. And uh, number two for the um, Brady Wickering, a junior midfielder. Now, kids, we've got a little bit of time, uh, you know, as, as we've got that 7-0 lead and and uh, got a lot of the substitutes in here. Would you, you see that goal in the in the girls' PK shootout the other day no, for, the, I missed for the Jaguars? It. That was for Ank that was Ankeny. That was Ankeny against uh, Dallas Center Grimes last Friday. Did you hear about that, Kenzie? I heard a little bit about it, but yeah. tell me again because I kind of so forgot. So uh, it was a PK for Dallas Center Grimes or for Ankeny. Ankeny took the PK. It lit up off of the crossbar on top. Went about 40 feet up into the air, but had spin on it. And the goalkeeper saw it go off the uh, top of the standard and and celebrated because that would have won them the shootout. And she stepped away, started walking away. The ball hit the ground right probably about where the PK symbol is at for take the PK and started spinning and rolled right back in and scored the goal while they were, still, while they were celebrating the win. Oh and, my gosh. and uh, so she just didn't stop the ball from completely going in. And on that same motion, it uh, we had enough spin on it that it was able to spin back into the uh, into the goal goal for the um, for the goal to uh, keep that uh, going for them, keep Ankeny Hawks in it. But then it went to the 14th PK, and finally Dallas Center Grimes did end up winning it uh, at that point, which is probably the the right thing to happen. But uh, would have been a heartbreaker if. Uh, Dallas Center Grimes then would have ended up losing that on you know on that situation, but yeah, uh, crazy. Really, yeah. Uh, Producer Andy just said that uh, we had over half a million views on that. I think it's kind of one of those uh, you know not so good moments uh, on Sports Center maybe, but uh, like I said, the uh, end result uh, for Dallas Center Grimes ended up being a positive one, even though that they gave up that goal. But uh, super interesting play though. That is super interesting. Don't see it very often, you know. It's uh, no. My most interesting PK story was probably when we had to do. We were playing Centennial versus Ankeny, and we had to end up doing our PKs the next day because the weather got so bad. Oh yeah, and I double overtime. I remember that. Yeah. So we came out and we warmed up like a normal practice, and then we. Drove across town to do some PKs, and then we were done. Yeah, I don't think I've ever heard of that happening either. As the uh, Jags almost give up the ball in a precarious position and do get called for a foul here. So the Riverhawks are going to have a nice little ball about 10 yards out of the uh, box here. Be a great opportunity for them to get on the scoreboard, uh, but also an opportunity for the Jaguars to keep the clean sheet. Looks like they're going to set up a three-person wall, four-person wall. As uh, Andrew Nelson 
is setting up uh, his wall. So now, Mackenzie, they set that wall up. What's the purpose of the wall? What are, what are they trying to accomplish by setting up that wall? So for your wall, what you want to do is you want to block the front post to give your keeper a smaller space to defend. Got it. So he's trying to take away a specific part of the goal that they don't necessarily are going to have to worry about or yep. it's going to have to be an aggressive kick to that point where they will feel like they can get over and yep. still cover that. Yep. But then he can focus on – maybe they take away a third. He can focus on defending the other two-thirds, yep. which uh, just makes it a little bit easier for him to make a play on those balls when it, it does attack. So the bigger the wall, the more they, they can kind of take up space, but also takes away some of your defenders. Yeah. That, could be uh, preventing those runners from getting those runs in, into attack as well. Typically, you'll never see a wall with more than five. Most Usually, mostly only four, though. Yep. Got a couple other subs coming in. We got four, 15, 20, and we will be trading goals as, goalies as well for the for the, um, for the the Jaguars. Let me see. I got an update on a score here. Um, that's the Hawk boys. Uh, they net a PK to make it 3-0. Looks like that game is still in effect, but they're ahead 3-0 right now. So I think we got into the game. We got Ezra Mugabe, number four, number 15. Did I see that right? Duong, I think, got into the game. We got a new goalie. Lucas Derby is into the game. And then number 20, I believe, Max Rush. Um... It shows that he's in uh, grade zero. I don't think that is accurate <laughs> uh, from the program. So I think I got all those right. I'm trying to look over the field here, making sure I got those right. I tried to write them down pretty quickly. Yep, I think we got them right. Might not have said number 15, Dai, Dwai Duong. Lucas Derby is going to get his first touches of the night as he steps out of the box and steps up and uh, stops that ball from getting too far into the offensive zone for the River Hawks. Nice idea there. Max the Rush just into the game. Eric Farland comes out, picks up that ball. Yeah, your story, uh, Kenzie, it's a tough way to win or lose either way. It's a interesting way to win, but a tough way to lose having a PKs the next day. Did you guys win or lose that game? We did win. You did win that game. I know back then, I mean, it's always a big rivalry no matter what. But yes. uh, I, I know that uh, a couple years there, I mean, we had the obviously the two best teams in the state for quite a few years yeah. consecutively around that time time frame. Stopping the clock. Then a couple subs coming in. Brady Wickering, number two, number 15, coming in. Uh, Cam Bugin coming in again for the River Hawks. Will Schissel throwing the ball in, number 23, one of the starters. Four one five. They want on the clock. Interesting. Uh, at seven to zero, that they're trying to add some time onto the clock, but they get that set up at four fifteen, and we got a throw in for the Riverhawks. Nice little throw in there from Shizzle, but it's controlled by the Jaguars. Making me a little nervous that they're uh, cycling the ball so far deep into their zone here, but it uh, looks like they're able to bring it up right now here. They got the opening that they needed to uh, get the ball moving forward. Nice pass to the outside. The flag stays down. 
As we'll get one of these reserves, take a shot on goal, bounces off the goalkeeper, and he's able to control it. That was number 23, Ty Sexton, that made that run, one of the freshmen on the squad that made that run and uh, had a decent shot on goal. Yeah, I would have liked to see him take that ball all the way down and cross it back in, but you're a freshman and you're up 7-0, to zero, so you want to be part of those goal <laughs> exactly, stars too. Exactly, exactly. So you can get on to the uh, score sheet. We're going to be bringing up the Lamberti Murphy and Strong player of the game here as, uh, as we wind down with this last uh, three minutes. Kenzie, you have to start formulating who you think is going to be that uh, person. I think I kind of got a pretty good idea as well. Got goal scoring tonight uh, from Kenninger. Got a couple goals from Kruger. Lucas De La Cuba with one. And then uh, three from Ty Duax. I think, you know, something else to think about is, uh, you know, Andrew Nelson with a clean sheet there, the goalkeeper. But really, he wasn't tested all that much tonight. Yeah. I think this is definitely going to be an offensive player, um, you know, winning the uh, player of the game tonight for sure. So the reserves are doing a pretty good job of uh, connecting here. They've got some nice tight passes here as they take a long-distance shot here. But it really hasn't been a lapse in the offense at all. No. They've definitely kept that level high. And as I say that, they send it out of bounds. <laughs> and it'll be a throw-in for the River Hawks. But they get possession right back again. Almost a uh, turnover right at uh, midfield, but uh, the ball skips through there and gets them out of trouble. Nice little pass to the outside to 24, Ethan Sexto. And then nice touch back into the middle by Arnold Islamovic, and he sends it over the top of the crossbar. It looks like we got a touch on that. It'll be a corner kick with just a minute left to go. Um, Ethan Sexto is going to be taking this corner kick with just a – Second under a minute here. Just to give you another uh, update. The Jags win two to zero over Urbandale. That's the Gals game that's uh, up on uh, up at the other field at the Centennial High School field. Corner kicks tonight brought to you by Iowa Rush at iowarush.com. We'll get another one here as he sends it in with 30 seconds left to go. Ooh, almost a nice little header there for the score, but it goes out of bounds and it was touched by a. Hey, Riverhawk again as they get three balls over there to uh, <laughs> to get set up for this penalty or for this uh, corner kick. And they get those balls out of the way and they send it in one more time. Jags jumping all over the place, but it does go back over the top of the uh, crossbar again. And I think uh, kind of looked at each other, Kenzie, and I think for the Lamberti, Murphy, and uh, strong player of the game, we got to go with Ty Duax with the three goals. Like I said, it's been a good night with the scoring to uh, scoring kind of spread around the team, but I don't think we can deny uh, kind of the dominance that Ty exhibited in the game with those three three goals in the hat trick. Yeah, definitely um, came out strong right at, right away at the beginning of the game. Um, had some really good plays, some plays where he was really patient and waited for that opportunity. So yeah, definitely a nice game from him. Yeah, that brings the record for the the uh, Jaguars to two to three early on in this season. Um, like I said, during the game, it's a good game to kind of get their confidence back and get things going in the right direction uh, with that 7-0 win over the Riverhawks tonight. Uh, appreciate having uh, Kenzie here with me um, doing the game tonight. Uh, appreciate her insight and uh, appreciate everybody watching at home. And we'll be looking forward to our next broadcast here shortly. Friday night, uh, we got a doubleheader uh, with uh, both the Centennial teams up against the uh, Scud Catholic is where's that uh, Omaha. So we've got an out of town team coming in for that game as well. So we'll look forward to seeing everybody on Friday for that game. This is Austin and Kenzie signing off for the night. Freedom Tire is proud to be the title sponsor of supporting Jaguar student athletes through Centennial Digital. With six locations around the metro, you're never far from getting you back or keeping your family safely on the road. 
Our certified staff and state-of-the-art technology means you can take comfort knowing you've got the best work at the best prices. Come see us at Freedom Tire, a proud supporter of Centennial Digital.